I'm Everdeen Mason. I'm an audience editor, and I'm the science fiction and fantasy columnist at the Washington Post. Please subscribe. Democracy dies if you don't subscribe. Thank you. Do it. <laughs> Do it. Keep so, the post alive. Um, I have some formalities that I have to get through first. So the Washington Post is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. Uh, and we'd like to give thanks to the co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and the other generous sponsors who've made this event possible. If you'd like to add your financial support, please note the information in your programs. Um, we'll have some time after this presentation for your questions, and I've been asked to remind you that if you come up to the microphone, you will be included in the videotape of this event, which could be broadcast at a later date. Um, make sure your cell phones are on silent, the usual. Um, and so I'm very honored to be here today with Lee Bardugo, and I am super lucky, and I got to interview her like two years ago, and in that time, she's published a bunch of stuff. Um, you've got Wonder Woman Warbringer, you released a collection of short stories, mm -hmm. um, and that's The Language of Thorns. Um, and she finished her latest duology, uh, which includes Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, which is probably why you all are here today, right? <laughs> How many of you have read Finish the Series? Yeah? That's really exciting. Those of you who did not raise your hands, you have homework. So <laughs> get out. All right. I think this is as much loitering okay. as I can do. All right. But um, so if Six of Crows is kind of like your straight up heist, yes. Crooked Kingdom is like a tangle of con jobs. Yes. Um, how, how do you plot these elaborate schemes? Oh, wow. Well, there's a reason it's a duology, because um, cons and heists are incredibly challenging to write. And what I usually start with is um, with the twists. I start with where I know I want the heist to end up. And um, I think it was Ali Carter who wrote the wonderful Heist Society books who told me, you're really conning two people. There's the mark in the book, and then there's the audience. So I want you guys to have the experience of reading the heist, thinking you know where it's going, and, and then pulling out the rug from under you. But um, yeah, Six of Crows is one big heist. It's really structured like a classic heist film or a classic heist story. And I thought of Crooked Kingdom more as kind of a matryoshka doll of just, uh, I wanted to get more and more claustrophobic as you moved through it as the, as the crew got more and more trapped. Yeah. And you know, within your multi-layered cons, you also have six points of view, basically, mm. that you're constantly cycling through. How do you plan and plot out all those characters within your cons? Um, well, I don't want to give a false impression that I map everything out. Yeah. I map the plot. Mm -hmm. I have a basic understanding of who the characters are and the role they occupy in the plot. And one thing I wanted to know going into Six of Crows was what emotional uh, what, what was the real fight for them in the heist? They each have a task to accomplish, but which thing they were going to have to face, which fear or danger they were going to have to face for that character arc. But beyond that, I didn't know what their backstories were, really. I discovered them as I was writing them. And some of them spoke loud and clear at the start of the book, and some of them it really took a while to get to know. Yeah, and actually, you know, in Crooked Kingdom, a character that we get to know that I really appreciated was Jesper. Um, so we really get to see that character and see, and he really holds his own against the others, even though his, his backstory is not as tragic as some of the other characters. It's tragic. It's tragic, you're right. I was but, like, I'm so disappointed. I was like, like, I thought it was tragic. Well, it's tragic, but it's not like, I don't know. He suffered. He didn't have to like, Ride his br brother's, brother's corpse, corpse to freedom. Yeah, so, yeah. So I think, for example, <laughs> hypothetically, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, but can you tell me a little bit about how you know Jasper came to grow and really flourish in Crooked Kingdom? Jasper really began as a description, as a sharpshooter, and then I remember the moment when I was thinking about. Um, you know, if in part of my research I went to a gun range and you learn to shoot and, uh, and the idea of focusing and um, I wanted him to have approached this particular line of work for a reason. And for him, it's a kind of self-medication. Risk is a way for him to focus his mind and to shut down the noise in his head. And whether that manifests as something like gambling at Mocker's Wheel, or it manifests as getting into really dangerous situations, this is maybe not the best way to go about mm -hmm. dealing with your problems. Kids, don't do this. So, uh, but this is something that he's doing and something that actually Inej confronts him about in Crooked Kingdom, about understanding understanding sort of what your wound is and, uh, and seeing it and healing it. Um, but I just, I love writing him. I loved writing his backstory. I love writing about Novia Zem. 
Um, and I loved writing about his dad. I mean, spoiler, if you haven't read Crooked Kingdom, his, his dad shows up. And one of my favorite things in YA novels is when you have these kids who are like, yeah, we're running heists and we're in a gang and all this stuff. And then your dad shows up and you're like, um, <laughs> everything's fine here, you know? <laughs> so that was, for me, I love, and I also wanted to write a positive parental figure because most of the parents I write are kind of horrible. So I wanted to write a, a good parent. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because like the point of most children's keepers is that they're generally unsupervised right. <laughs> like, yeah. the entire time. I mean, that's so. why there are so many orphans in fantasy. Like you're like, well, if you're going to go off to save the world, you I, probably yeah. don't want to get grounded. You know, I'm at that stage in my life where I'm starting to relate to the parents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, start, I'm like, where are their parents? What's going on? I Anyways, know. That's fine. Um, but actually, so you, you mentioned doing research. You went to actually shoot a gun at a gun range um, and think about that. And one thing that I was really struck by by our conversation a while back is all the research you put into Inez's character and like getting into her backstory, you told me that you interviewed three victims of human trafficking and that kind of thing. Um, you know, what, and, and that's really great because you have a younger audience who maybe is not reading those news stories on a daily basis and they get to learn about a different thing through your work. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit more about what drove you to kind of explore that theme in your fiction? When I set out to write Six of Crows, one of the things that was a, oh, really an additional character in the story is Ketterdam and the country of Kerch. And I had known early on that I wanted to write this country as almost like an anti-Ravka. Ravka was the setting for my first trilogy and is where most of King of Scars takes place too. And Ravka is kind of cut off from, oh, I suddenly got very loud. Hello. <laughs> she said as she looked down at her brazia. Um, so Ravka is this kind of uh, backworld uh, place where, uh, where there's been a failure to industrialize, whereas Ketterdam is international, it's cosmopolitan, it's the hub of all legal and illegal trade in the world. And I wanted the culture that had grown up about it to be kind of like an extreme version of the Protestant work ethic. This is a place where profit and prosperity is a sign that you were ordained by God, and where they worship Gazin and the invisible hand, which anybody who's familiar with Adam Smith will recognize. So this is a place where the market rules, and if you're doing that, then you have to ask the question, if profit is seen as not only um, a, a good goal, but a sacred goal, what is the human cost of that? And if you only see humans as commodities, I think Inez's story is the inevitable result of that. So I wanted to show the impact that it had for better and for worse on individual members of this crew. Yeah. And so Inez is clearly my actual favorite character. Jasper's like second favorite, but it's Inez. <laughs> um, but one thing I like about her and I like about Nina is that they're dealing with their trauma. They have this, you know, these issues that they're dealing with and they also still manage to keep it together wrangle the boys, <laughs> get them to put their shoes on and go do the heist. Like, I, can you tell me more about how, how that dynamic worked out between your characters as you started writing? That's really interesting. I don't really think of either of them as being like the mom of the group. No, like, but, I'm not sure this group has a mom, you know? Like, yeah. maybe why? But they're more insightful. They'll be like, you clearly have like ADD and you shouldn't go right. to heist. Like, I don't know. I think they are, but well, look, this is a requirement though. In order to survive, both yeah. of these women have had to do certain things. And if they had let themselves completely fall apart, then they wouldn't be there. They wouldn't be surviving. And so they've made certain choices and certain sacrifices that have allowed them to keep going. And with Inej, you see that rear its head in, in different forms. There are different battles she has to fight before she can find her way to really being free, not just being free on the streets of Ketterdam. And for Nina, it's a journey that has a lot to do with um, who she is as a soldier and as a person, and that continues in King of Scars, because a lot of people were very angry with me about some of the things that happened in Crooked Kingdom, and I'm not sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just not. Um, but that for me was something that I knew that Nina's story didn't end there, and I knew where I wanted to take her, and you know, there were some casualties along the way. <laughs> oh, I just got so sad. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. I'm sorry. But I'm not. <laughs> well, let's bring it back to something fun because I am. Um, well, that wasn't fun. Yeah, I mean it is. <laughs> But I am a 30-year-old woman who reads YA for the makeouts, if I'm being entirely honest with you. Wow, my books must yeah. suck for you because everybody's <laughs> like, don't touch me. 
Honestly, that worked for me. I was like, okay. <laughs> worked for me. But, you know, did you did you always know what these pairings were going to be or did those also kind of evolve naturally no, with their backstories? Oh, yeah. Like knew. I knew. I love romance and I love shipping and I think that I think there's this real tendency to look at romance and stories and somehow try to say that the story is lesser because it focuses on romance. And it's something that I've seen from a lot of adult uh, SFNF crowds that really disdain YA and, and, and its focus on emotionality and relationships. And I find that hilarious because so many people spend so much of their lives looking for somebody to share that life with. And I mean, Tinder wouldn't exist if it weren't for <laughs> this drive. And I don't think that it is makes the book lesser or less interesting or have less gravitas because it addresses that emotionality. For me, the big thing is that I don't want those relationships to all only occupy romantic space. Friendship is essential. The way these friendships impact these romantic entanglements matter. Um, and also, the sense of finding your family is just as essential to me as um, the romantic elements of the book. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing that I really like is because you have two characters who, like, cannot touch each other really, every single possible, like, brush has the elevation of, like, a kiss now. I do so love really, a slow burn. Yeah, I do. You gave me a whole book of like almost kisses. It's just as good. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that's okay. what fanfic is for. Like, go for it. Do you have any? <laughs> do you have any uh, pairings that did not exist in the book that you like quietly thought of that you were like maybe I'll oh, pair? Interesting. Yeah. No. <laughs> like I don't. If I want a ship to exist, I'll just write it. Like okay. I, don't, I guess that's, you know, like, that's the magic of canon. Oh, I yeah. can be like, no, this will come to pass. Um, <laughs> No, I do feel like I had a million crack ships in Shadow and Bone. Like, yeah. I honestly, I, I'm one of those people who ships everyone with everything. I don't know if <laughs> any of you have ever watched Avatar, The Last yeah. Airbender. I'm one of those weirdos who both shipped Katang and Zutara, okay? Like, I was like, I ship it all. I ship chair with stage. I ship <laughs> lamp with table. Like, I'm just like, I really think it's fun to, to think that way. Yeah. And when I was writing Wonder Woman Warbringer, I was like, mm. I want everybody to be attracted to each other at all times. <laughs> I think you've captured the essence of youth. <laughs> it's just everyone's <laughs> constant attraction. Um, but you, you brought up the Alina Starkov books. Um, and Crooked Kingdom is set in the same world as those mm -hmm. books, um, but obviously it's a very different book. Yeah. Um, and in what ways do you see the newer series as almost like a response to what you've already explored in Ravka? You talked a little bit about the settings. Well, but... I think that Shadow and Moan is a very traditional hero's journey. It's a chosen one story. And I think if you read Six of Crows, you will you can see there's even a character who addresses the chosen one trope explicitly in Crooked Kingdom. And I really wanted to ask the question, what happens in fantasy worlds to the people who don't have grand destinies and who don't have secret powers, who aren't secret princesses, who are essentially expendable to the larger plot? What becomes of them? And who really have nothing to rely on but their skills and each other. And so for me, Six of Crows was almost a direct response to mm -hmm. my experience writing Shadow and Bone. And I want to say too, like as much as I ship everything, like that's not what all books have to be about. Like I am one of those people who will watch a television show and be like, where's the romance? Like Great British Baking Show, I'm like, okay, but <laughs> will they, won't they? But. <laughs> That said, I don't write, like, I, I've actually gotten complaints from readers who are like, where's my smut? And I'm like, I don't write that. Like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. Like, I'm not that kind of writer, you know? Like, again, praise the fanfic writers, but I, I can't do it. I know. I mean, if you do want to write fanfic of your own work, you have an audience. <laughs> I'm I mean, kidding. if I ever grow broke, I'm just going to be like, darkling after dark. Just checking in. Okay. I think it could really work. Um, but, uh, you know, you... Sorry. <laughs> but you've, been, you've been really prolific these last couple years. I'm wondering, you know, what are things that you've tried to work on and improve from book to book? Um, if there are things that you're like, I know I can do that better in the next one, or... I mean, the glaring thing, I think, is diversity. It's 
honestly a little embarrassing to look back at um, the way that I cast Shadow and Bone because it is an overwhelmingly white and straight series. And it becomes less so as it progresses, but I think that I think the question I found myself asking is, why did I write it that way? I grew up in Los Angeles. This is not what my peer group looks like at all. And I think I was echoing a lot of the fantasy that I read growing up. So I've tried to move towards um, a, a cast of characters that looks more like the people I know um, and that is more representative. I think also just I, I think I became a better writer. I think writing short stories made me a better writer. I think it's if you, if there are, are there any aspiring writers in the... <laughs> there's, such a, there's a storm coming. No. Um, what I would say is, you know, short fiction is incredibly challenging. It forces you to really dig into your craft in a way that um, I think has really helped me. So the, the act of writing short stories as I was writing novels, I think, changed the way that I engaged with language, too. So I don't know. I'm in sort of a constant state of revision. I'm a profound believer in revision. My drafts tend to be absolute garbage. Um, early on, and it's very uncomfortable. Like, I say that very blithely, but it's an incredibly difficult state to live in when you know what good writing is and you know what you're doing is not good. Um, but I think that discomfort of the first draft is unavoidable, and I think it's something that if we were taught to live with that discomfort, people would understand the process of writing much better and they would get through it more easily. Mm -hmm. And um, the other, you know, Sorry, you brought up um, diversity, and you know I'm sure you're all aware that's an that's it's an issue that's been coming up a lot more. People are a lot more vocal about it. You know, what kind of conversations have you been having with your peer group of writers about how to talk about this problem, how to elevate other writers? You know, I mean, what's that look like what, right now within like your cohort of people? As a white writer, I think the thing that the focus has to be is on elevating other voices. So that if you have the opportunity to do an event with a writer who's maybe not getting as much attention, but who has written a fantastic fantasy that is set in a different kind of world mm -hmm. than what we're used to seeing. Um, if you have the opportunity when you do book lists of, you know, what are your fave this or your fave that, that is your chief obligation. Um, and also just, <laughs> And this is something that I think everybody is always trying to work on, to know the difference between trying to write representatively as opposed to taking somebody else's story. And I don't think that there's a, a perfect answer to that or a balance. Everybody is always learning. And the best advice I can give to people who are attempting to do that and the thing that, that we talk about most um, is just listening to each other. Like, make more friends. <laughs> like, and I know that's hard because writers are weirdos and we like to stay home and we don't really need friends other than fictional characters. But <laughs> having friends who, are, who, who do not come from your background, who you grew up with or who, who you encounter through critique groups or whatever it is, like, make those friends and engage those relationships. Follow those artists on Twitter and um, read their books, read their blogs. That is the best way to sort of fulfill that obligation and to try to engage with, um, with other people without othering them. And um, I wanted to ask, you know, going back to your books, uh, what, was your fa what scenes were your favorites to write that you, hmm. you just got really excited about? Without spoil, I mean, most of you have already read the books. So I guess you can spoil her. In but. Six of Crows, like, favorite scenes or? Yeah, that series. Or Crooked Kingdom. Um, I think that, oh man, I don't know. So <laughs> there's a fight, there's a fist fight in between Kaz and Jesper in Crooked Kingdom. And I love that scene because there's a little, there's, it, it's because the audience knows, the reader knows how much emotion is wrapped up in it but it's also just two guys who really don't know how to talk to each other and are like, Nyah! And I loved writing that. And I also loved writing Colm Fahey just being like, you just stop, you just stop it. Um, I loved writing that. I will say that the most challenging scene to write was there's a scene between Kaz and Inej um, that is where he's tending to her bandages. And That's my favorite scene. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> but there are probably 32 different versions of that scene. It was one of the most challenging scenes I've ever written. Um, and I'm proud of it. Like, I'm proud of where it ended up. But I, there were moments where I thought, I don't know how to get this right. And I didn't want to do, you know, I didn't want to not do justice to those characters and what they'd been through in that mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. 
With King of Scars, I was kind of surprised because Zoya's chapters turned out to be the most fun to write, really? which I did not know. Zoya's mean, and I love writing <laughs> her. She's so unapologetic, and I loved discovering her and her history and writing her. She was really, I love her journey in, in King of Scars. Yeah. And so besides Zoya, and I assume also, um, who, who else is going to be? Nikolai has his own POV, obviously. It would be hilarious if he didn't. If he was just like, I'm gonna sit this one out. Um, Nick, the, there are three primary POVs. You guys know I like to throw in a, an occasional red shirt who's gonna get murdered. Um, but there's uh, Zoya, Nikolai, and Nina from Six of Crows has a POV too. She's in Fierda, um, basically on an undercover mission. Um, and also, I don't wanna, spoil Crooked Kingdom for anybody who has, but she has another mission, a personal mission to accomplish there as well. Yeah. Anything yeah. else you can tell us about the book? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm I, working for you guys. I will say that it is probably has the most magic on the page that I've ever written. The Grisha magical system is fairly tightly constrained, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this is a story where you really find out the roots of Grisha power and where there's a lot of blurring of the line between myth and religion and science and superstition. And it was really exciting for me to write. Um, anything, and there, like, all I will ask is if you guys do read it when it comes out, and I hope you will, please don't spoil it for other people because there are some sort of ginormous twists in it. So, yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so you know, I'm glad you're sticking with fantasy. You know, mm -hmm. what what is it about fantasy that you enjoy? I you know, it's so, it's so rare that I don't seek out something with a fantastical element. I love genre. I grew up on genre. It was the thing that really saved me from the absolute mundanity of my world. I hated school. No offense to school, but I was miserable. I was in this weird all-girls private school, and they were just like, you mm, strange goth girl. What are you doing here? Um, but it was just, it was not... <laughs> It was the 90s, it was a terrible time. Um, but I was, I was utterly miserable there. I was having a really rough time at home. My mom had just remarried. Like that was when I discovered genre and writing fantasy really was like a survival mechanism. And I think, I don't know, I think fantasy readers have an edge on everyone. Like we never stop believing in weird, magical, incredible stuff. You know, for us, the call box is always bigger on the inside. We are always waiting for the invitation to Hogwarts. We always think there's something lurking in the woods and it's the best way to live and I would not want to live any way else, you know? Yeah. So yeah, fantasy or, or die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, although <laughs> I, everybody's like, yeah, <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> Don't encourage me. Yes. <laughs> no, but it's funny because I feel like so much fantasy is centered around youth and like who's going to write the magical girl anime for us? Like woman turns 30 uh, and has cinema. a certain cellulite ratio and now I she actually, gets transferred. I really wanted, <laughs> I pitched a screenplay at one point that was about um, a chosen one who was in her 30s and like the like dark immortal shows up to find the chosen one. He's like, what? Like, <laughs> because it's so creepy that the dark immortal one is always like, ah, oh, teenage girl, excellent. You know, like I just wanted, yeah. I was imagining like Tina Fey or like, you know, yeah. just being like, I think what? it's because teens don't have like jobs that they have to go to. I mean, it's like, easier to save the world when you don't have to worry about like benefits or, you know, <laughs> like. But I will say too, like, I do think that those stories retain resonance for us. And, um, and I just don't, I don't think the idea of the magical journey or of um, these uh, secret spaces ever lose their excitement as we get older. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that I'm, I'm very impressed with by you, just in general, but you've had a lot of jobs that are not writing, mm. and you know you've been a makeup artist. You're in a band. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's not are a you good still in band. a band? Yeah. Um, yeah. We actually just recorded two songs. If you follow me on the Instagram, like um, I actually posted a couple of clips, and we'll see how the songs turn out. If I actually am not too embarrassed by them, I'll post them. I think it's a good idea to keep your toe into other creative things. I think it's good to rest the writing muscle and, and engage the creative muscle elsewhere. Um, I also think, you know, I think it's good to have a lot of jobs um, and to have had to hustle because writing is hard. It's a hard business and um, 
and I think people sometimes forget it's a business, and that can be really difficult to balance the creative and, and, and this other side of it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't trust people who have never had a bad job. I really don't. I don't trust somebody who's never had a bad job or a bad boss. I'm like, what do you know about anything if you have never had a Sunday night when you've been like, and it's, it's the same as school. Like, I used to feel this way. I would just be like, oh, Monday is upon me. You know, like, I remember that dread, and, um, and I think it's made me grateful for so much that's happened since. Yeah. 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 And um, so, forgot my line of questioning. I'm going to turn <laughs> my phone. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't do this it's okay. very often. I'm just, I just overwhelmed you with my, with my wisdom. <laughs> I know, I'm so much wiser. Um, so tell us what you have beyond. So King of Scars is coming out next year in 2019. Yes. Yeah. And you have an adult fiction book coming out yes. after that. Um, yeah, my first novel for adults, I guess, is um, called Ninth House. And it is also fantasy, but it is set at Yale University. It is a um, occult murder mystery set among the secret societies there. And um, it's, it's definitely a bit different from what I've done, but I think that people, especially people who liked Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, um, will find the same elements of dark magic and, and, and power operating there. Um, but that is set for September of next year. Oh, okay. Yeah, assuming I finish it, so keep your fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> And King of Scars comes out in January. And King of Scars is a duology. Um, so those are the two big things on the horizon for me. Okay. And can you tell us a little bit about you know, what's inspiring you these days as far as your writing goes? Like, what are you reading? What are you listening to? Um, oh, gosh. I mean, I have listened to the same album music composer to draft all of my books since Six of Crows. Oh. And it was, um, he's named Ludovico Einaldi, and he's an Italian composer. And I know it's not like hip or cool. I don't know what the youth listens to. But um, <laughs> I love his music. And for whatever reason, it, it tricks something in my brain and really allows me to go into this kind of deep, productive mode um, that I love. Also, you know, forever Stevie Nicks. Like, I listen to Fleetwood Mac on the regular. <laughs> and that's to me. And also, um, I'll say Janelle Monet's last album was for me, like, like the most joy-bringing um, like angry making wonderful thing to listen to when I needed like to break and like refresh. Yeah, yeah. And how am I doing on time? Um, I good? Okay. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so, but I kind of want to go back. I just want to keep talking about Jesper. <laughs> <laughs> I have a crush on him. I'm so glad. <laughs> he has the same last name as my husband. No way. Yeah. You're a Fahey. I guess technically, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, you. he was named after my friend Morgan Fahey, so there you go. There you go. You're We're all related, family. actually, I'm right. to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, you know, when coming up with that character, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about when you were designing his relationship with his father? I think it's interesting, he's biracial, his father does not necessarily look like him, and you kind of intimate you know, the way that that world is made up. Can you tell me a little bit about what went into that, what kind of research he did? I. I mean, I, again, my peer group is um, largely made up of biracial couples. And um, for me, they're the first people I come to, even though they're not writers, per se, if I'm going to be addressing a, uh, the experience of a character of color. And um, when I was creating No Museum, there were a lot of questions for me. And, and I think that there are things that I could have done better or done differently in the construction of that world. But um, that for me, I wanted to create a nation of, of, that was people of color who had the most advanced technology and who had pushed back any kind of colonial impulse and that had this um, thriving culture and where they approach Grisha power as something very different than Ravka does and where Jesper's mother really would not have wanted him to go fight for Ravka um, just because he happened to have been born with this gift. So they have a very different relationship to magic than the Ravkins do. It's not militarized in the same way. Um, and there's actually a character in King of Scars, Lanny, um, and I'm, that's all I'm going to say about her right now. But she's from <laughs> Novi Zem, and some of you may recognize her from Crooked Kingdom too. She was a minor character in it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think we're at the time for questions, and I'm sure you guys have lots of them. I so, hope so why don't you guys come up to the microphones and start lobbing questions her way? Hello. Hi. 
<laughs> She's dressed as um, Laura okay. Jean, and she looks amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so if you could like drop another character or a bunch of characters from another YA series into the Grishaverse, who would you oh drop in? Personally, I would suggest Laya and Sarah meets Inej, and they just have tea. Wait, who's the meeting? Laya and oh, Inej. Oh, Laya! Oh, that was so... I like that idea a lot. Um, oh, wow. That's really hard. <laughs> I'm always afraid of dropping characters in my world because I'm pretty sure they'll get murdered. Um, you know, I'm a huge Lainey Taylor fan. You know what I would do? I would grab Brimstone, and I would save him. And he would, yeah, I would save him and I would put him in a palace in Ravka because he's one of my favorite characters of all time. Yeah. Oh, and I'd grab Howl from Howl's Moving Castle. Yeah. And I would just have him in Ketterdam living the life. Like. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I have a writing question. So um, I was just wondering, do you have any advice for writers who are like at the so close stage, like polishing up their, their manuscript it's about to query editing and all that, and just kind of so close. I mean, I assume you have critique partners. Yeah, betas, critique partners, editors, Great. lots of queries. OK. <laughs> I mean, look, querying is terrible. It's a horrible, frightening experience. Querying is when you, you write a letter or an email, and you go out to agents hoping that someone will represent you. My best advice for querying is to treat your query letter the same way you treat your manuscript. Your critique partner should be reading that too. And you should have people who have never read your book read the query to make sure that your pitch makes sense. Mm -hmm. Keep it short. Be really careful in your querying. Like, really know who you're going after. And query in small batches so that if you're not getting the response you want, you can tweak your approach. Mm -hmm. Because it may not be that your book isn't interesting or isn't right for the market. Mm -hmm. It may just be that, that, that you're coming in the wrong way. My agent, I never let her forget this. She literally said, she's like, well, the letter wasn't very good, but lucky for you, the pages were, you know? So, but you, it's very hard to get your foot in that door. And I would say, too, if you're going out on query, and then if you happen to, to get represented and go on submissions, if you don't get the response you want right away, do not give up, OK? The market is fickle. Publishing is difficult, and people get shut down. All it means is you may have to put that book away for a little while, be working on something else while you're querying, because it is not the be all end all. And if you sell that next book, the, the first thing they're going to say is, what else do you have? And you'll be like, oh, hello. Look what I have for you. But don't let it, be, don't let it make you think it has something to do with your talent or the quality of your work. It is a market. It is a business. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, so clearly in your work, um, you've extensively researched like real history and cultures and countries to influence your world building. Mm. But how do you draw the line between like the real history and how do you decide when to shift things and when to keep things the same as they are in reality? Look, I can't pretend to be an expert on that. I've taken a lot of heat for some of the choices that I've made in terms of language and culture and history. I treat historical inspiration as a point of departure. The thing I would say is, what makes a fantasy feel real is, to me, that grounding. So if you're going to write about dictatorships, you should read about dictatorships. If you're going to write about farming, you should read about farming. I hate nautical research. I will never write a book on a boat again, because Siege and Storm is set on a boat. And I was like, if I have to read the word mizzenmast again, I am going to lose my mind. Um, but these are the things we, and the thing about research is that you don't know what you're going to call. And so you really have to use a kind of soft focus view and, and to really always be seeking inspiration and, and to try to fall in love with history um, as much as, as mining it for information. But I don't know if that actually answered your question, but that's my best shot. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So um, I had a question. I know you mentioned that your first drafts are normally garbage. They are. <laughs> and I really wanted to know how they compare to the final copy, because it is hard, like, to stop comparing your work to others. And I know, I <laughs> yeah. know. And I wanted to like really know like the details. Like, so my first, let's first. So what I write is what I call the zero draft. This is a draft that nobody will ever see. Not my editor, not my friends, anyone. This is where I'm telling myself the story, and it's full of placeholders and it's quite short. It's almost like an elaborate outline. The first zero draft of Six of Crows was thirty thousand words long. 
okay? The final draft of Six of Crows is 130,000 words long, okay? So, but I still have a whole book, so I can see the beginning and middle and end. Mm -hmm. I can see where there might be pacing problems, and I know what some of the questions are when I come out of it before I get too deeply in. Then, the first draft is still pretty terrible. <laughs> it really is. That's not where I'm, I think my, I think it was my friend Jess Brody said, you know, you can't decorate the house before the walls are built. So that's what you're doing. You're telling yourself the story and you need to give yourself permission to be as obvious and ridiculous as you need to be. And you need to give yourself permission to have moments where you feel like a hack or you feel like a fraud and you just keep moving through the story. I always describe writing a book as not the process of falling in love, but of staying in love. You fall in love with the idea, but there's a moment where you're gonna fall out of love and that moment could last a very long time. For me, I loved the idea for Six of Crows, but through drafts one and two and three, I kept thinking, wow, this is a great idea for a book and somebody else should write it. Um, somebody <laughs> smarter, you know? Like, I thought I was not up to the task and I did not fall back in love until I was really at the last pass before copy edits and I thought, okay, this is actually working. So you're not alone, you just have to keep going. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Hi. Um, I just want to say I'm such a big fan of your work. I've been reading it ever since it came out. Thank you. And um, something I thought was interesting is that you were coming out with an adult fantasy series. Mm -hmm. And I think it, like, fantasy is becoming more and more popular among YA books. And I kind of want to know, like, what's the difference between, like, a YA fantasy and adult fantasy? Like, how does that make it a, like a different story and affect the characters? You know, that's a great question. And I found myself asking it too because people kept saying, well, what makes this different from your other books? The closest I can get to telling you is that on one, part of it was just a gut thing. I knew that Alex's story did not belong in YA. And I can't give you like a concrete reasons for that. But the closest I can get is to say that YA tends to deal with a specific moment in time, particularly fantasy, right? You're leading up to a heist or a revolution, or, um, or a prom, or whatever it's going to be that is kind of this one clear moment. Whereas I think that in my adult fiction, it's really about the long game, because this is a girl who has um, come from tremendous disadvantage and who really just wants to survive in a world full of people who have a lot more privilege than she does. So I think that that, for me, is maybe the dividing line, but it's definitely a blurry one. And, and you can see there's a tremendous amount of crossover and readership between adult and YA fantasy. All right, thank you so much. You're so welcome. Hi, Hi. so um, I'm a huge fan of Six of Crows. And <laughs> as a writer, I've been always really impressed by like how intricate the plot was of that and Crooked Kingdom. Like just how many good plot twists there are, how, so I guess my question is like, how do you, what is your thought process when you go about like coming up with Kaz's plans and his heists. <laughs> um, so again, there's a reason it's a duology. Um, here's the thing about plotting. I plot, um, I use the screenplay method, the three act structure to plot. And what that helps me do is it helps me th see things like where the midpoint turnaround is, where the end of the first act is. And it's very useful to me in terms of pacing and understanding where I need a big moment in a story. When it comes to the complexity of the plot, what I am trying to do is throw up as many obstacles as I can. And I don't want them all to be the same. I want to really, like one of my favorite, one of the things I learned from reading George R. R. Martin was kill everyone. No, was. <laughs> But it actually wasn't. People are always like, who are you going to kill? And I'm like, who I kill isn't important. What matters is you take a character and what is most important to them and what they think defines them, and then you take it away. And that's what makes a plot interesting, not how many twists and turns yeah. there are. Those you'll get to. But in that first draft, when you're figuring it out, really be thinking about character, I think, more than anything else. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, I really love the world building in the Six of Crows books particularly, and so something I was wondering is you were talking about research, but what is your process like in terms of how much you know about the world as you're writing? Like, do you feel like you really know it early on, or is it something that comes through later in other revisions? Um, 
I know some things going in, but I don't know everything going in. Um, I, I tend to break world builders into two categories. There are the Tolkien's and there are the Martins. And that is not to say that you have to be an old white guy to write fantasy, you don't. Um, but those are, you know, these are worlds that a lot of people are familiar with. And Tolkien knew everything before he sat down to write. He had built these languages and, and these histories. And Martin didn't. You know, people, when people ask him, you know, where's the rest of the Dothraki before the television show? It didn't exist. He re wrote what he needed for the page. Um, you can be either. Right? There's no right way to build a world. You just have to be careful of the perils within them. Um, I tend to know the structure of the world and the way power operates in it, magical, political, personal, when I'm going in. And sometimes I know a little bit more about why the world operates in this way. But it's really not until the later drafts when the texture of a place, the smell of a place, the way its economics work really come into play. Um, and I think a story really only begins to walk and talk when those two things, sense of power and sense of place, start to work together. Thank you. You bet. Hi. I uh, really absolutely love the characters in Six of Crows and Cro Crooked Kingdom. I love them a lot. Uh, so who is your favorite of all the characters in, that, in the duology? And <laughs> what's your inspiration for them? Um, I don't really ha I mean, look, I don't have a favorite. Like, they have all been favorites of mine at certain moments, and I've wanted to murder all of them at, at certain times. That's just the reality of writing a character's journey. Um, I think that some characters were more natural for me to write, like Kaz and Nina, and I think some were harder to write. Um, well, no, Nina was tough, actually. You know, it was tough until I really got to know her. Um, but I think that um, in terms of inspiration, there's no particular person or actor or character who inspired them. Um, they really came to life. I will say that some of the fan art I've seen of them has actually changed the way I imagine them in my head. Um, and I didn't set out to do that, but you know, Kevin Wada tells you what Jesper looks like, and you're like, okay, <laughs> right? So good. So Sorry. good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You bet. Hi. So um, obviously, places in Six of Crows and the Grisha trilogy, a lot of them are inspired by real life places and mm -hmm. cultures. So I was wondering if you had like a specific maybe place or culture in mind that you kind of wanted to write about next, or maybe incorporate and give some like recognition to. Um. That's really interesting. I feel like whenever I travel, um, and I, I haven't been able to travel a lot in the last couple of years because of issues related to my disability, but I think that when I um, travel, I find myself um, looking for influence. I think, you know, I, I think there's already a little bit of Venice in um, Ketterdam, but I, it's my favorite city in the world, and I wouldn't mind writing. But I feel like Jay Kristoff already got there, but maybe I'll write my own Venetian-inspired fantasy someday. Thank you. You bet. Hi. So maybe you already answered this. I know you talked about revision earlier in mm. the interview. Um, so I was just going to ask any sort of tips you had for revision, or maybe what some of your like prominent stages and steps are in your revision process. Um, revision for me is, again, in the first couple of drafts to really let yourself off the hook. You are really trying to find your own way into the story. Um, then as I get deeper, I really rely on the editorial process. You have to have good readers who you trust and who are going to be able to divorce their own likes and preferences from the way that they give you critique. So find good critique partners and then listen to them with an open mind. As authors, we are asked to walk a line between delusions of grandeur and abject humility, and that is a hard thing to do, and you'll find yourself flopping either way. There are days where you're like, I'm a genius, and then there's days where you're like, I I'm nothing. So you have to, that is the challenge of being a creative person. I think we can do one more question, and I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Hi, so I'm taking a class this semester where we apply legal theory to sci-fi and fantasy. So I'm wondering how you constructed the We can take no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering how you constructed the legal slash political system in your books. Uh, <laughs> um, 
for me, those inspirations really did come from history. Um, there is a strong resemblance to um, Imperial Russia, particularly of the 1800s in Ravka. Um, the Dutch Republic of the 1700s was a huge influence on Ketterdam, um, particularly in the way that they operated their shipping. But there are also elements of those places that have to do with Las Vegas and early New York slash New Amsterdam. Um, but I, I really go to existing systems to guide me in those things. That was hard. That was a hard <laughs> question. I, w I need more about like who's your favorite character and what cappuccino do they drink. No. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we can take one more. Probably. Oh, just one more. Can we take one more? All right. Hi, Miss Bardugo. Hi. Um, this might seem like a kind of weird question, but how? Kaz like is one of my favorites, and he makes some at the very least questionable. Um, like decisions like during the books and like before the books and I'm just wondering how did you make him so likable because like <laughs> I love cause and like he just like murders people like oh yay here he he put just Roddy through the eye and pushed him off a boat so like all how right did you do all that? right how did I make Kaz likable some people don't like Kaz and when I wrote the <laughs> get out no. so some people don't like Kaz, and you have to be comfortable when you are writing a morally great character with not everybody liking that person. I think likability is boring. I think what's interesting is competence. What's interesting is reality and feeling like you're engaged in that person's struggle. And I like when people question why they like or don't like a character. But let's be honest, YA loves evil white boys. It, we all love it. You give a character dark hair and an, an agenda, and all of a sudden people are like, I know he murdered 50 people, but I love my small cinnamon roll. Like, <laughs> So this is the thing. But I love anti-heroes, and I think I'll always write them because I think they bear a greater resemblance to who we really are. Thank you. All right, folks, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.